So I'd like to start off my message tonight with just a couple of questions. Uh, the first question I have for you is, do you remember when you first got saved? Do you remember when you first got saved? Do you remember that moment when you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior? Uh, for me, it was, uh, I was a nine-year-old boy. I happened to, it was on a Sunday. I didn't get saved at church. I got saved in my home. Uh, one night, my dad uh, was uh, talking to my brother about being saved, and uh, he was talking to me also. And that night, I realized that I was in sinner in need of a, a sinner in need of a savior. And that night, I can remember just uh, the conviction of sin on my life. I was guilty. I can remember I was weeping, and I remember kneeling down on the couch, and I called out on Jesus to save me. And so I was nine years old when I accepted Jesus Christ, and I can remember as soon as I accepted Him as my Savior, I can just remember this feeling that came over me of just relief and excitement and joy. And it was an amazing feeling when I, when I got saved. Uh, after you got saved, do you remember how excited you were about serving God? Do you remember how everything seemed to connect with God? Uh, going to church was exciting. Uh, your Bible reading, you, you were excited to read your Bible every day. You were excited to pray. You were excited telling your friends about Jesus. And all these things brought joy to your life. Well, I would hope you would remember all those things. But on the contrary, how many of us would say that the things of God just don't excite us as much anymore. Uh, things like going to church have become boring. Uh, it's easier to stay home sometimes than to go to church. Or, or maybe you just read your Bible because you know you're supposed to read it, not because you're going to get anything out of it. Oftentimes we'd rather just be left alone to do as we please and serve God on our own terms. But it's sad because many believers are in that shape today. It could be said that a lot of Christians have lost their joy in serving God. But I want you to know tonight, things do not have to be that way. God has a plan for you, and it's illustrated here in these verses concerning Jacob. Uh, God, uh, he, in this passage, he is calling Jacob back to Bethel. Bethel means the house of God. And it was at Bethel that uh, Jacob met the Lord for the very first time. So if you'll flip with me just a couple chapters back to uh, Genesis chapter 28, verses 12 through th uh, 22. And I just want to read to you the account of how uh, Jacob met God. Verse 12, it says, And he dreamed and beheld a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven, and behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham thy father, and the God of Isaac, the land wherein thou liest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, to the east, and to the north, and to the south. And in thee, and in thy seed, shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And behold, I am with thee, and I will keep thee in all places whither thou goest, and will bring thee again into this land, for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken uh, to thee of. And Jacob awaked out of his sleep, and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. And he was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place. This is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. And Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he had put for his pillows and set it up for a pillar and poured oil upon the top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel. But the name of that city was called Luz at the first. And Jacob vowed a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. And this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house, and all that thou shalt give me I will surely give the tenth unto thee. So we see Jacob. He is dreaming a dream, and he sees a ladder that uh, it starts at earth, and it ascends up to heaven. And on that ladder he sees angels ascending and descending on it, and the Lord was at the top of it. And the Lord speaks to Jacob, and he makes some promises to Jacob one of which is that he's going to be with, uh, with him wherever he goes. Uh, Jacob awakes from this dream in fear. He realizes that the Lord's presence is there. So in the morning, Jacob decides to take the stone that he was using for a pillow, and he called that place Bethel. And we see Jacob, he makes a vow and a promise in verse 20 through 22. He basically says, if God will take care of me and God will provide for me and allow me to return to my father's house in peace, then the Lord will be my God. And this stone here is a, is a reminder because it will be God's house. So we know that Bethel is the place where Jacob first met God. 
But I want you to look at some other things about his life that will, and we'll apply them to our lives. You see, Jacob, he was raised by parents. He was raised in a home that knew God. His parents knew who God was. But in spite of that, every person must have a personal encounter with God. I thank God for the fact that I was raised uh, in a Christian home by parents who went to church, who loved the Lord, and I, I thank God that my dad was able to lead me to the Lord. And that's a privilege that not everybody gets to enjoy, but I did. But just because your mom and dad is a Christian doesn't make you one. We all have to have that moment where we personally accept Jesus Christ as our Savior. When Jacob met the Lord, we see he made vows in Genesis 28. And as we continue to study his life, it seems that he did not pay those vows right off the bat. Jacob may have forgotten about them, but one thing we do know is God did not forget. Uh, Deuteronomy 23, 31 says, When thou shalt vow a vow unto the Lord thy God, thou shalt not slack to pay it, for the Lord thy God will surely require it of thee, and it would be sin in thee. In our passage this evening, God is calling Jacob back to the place of his first blessing. He is calling him back to his uh, place of beginning, to the place where things with God were fresh, where things with God were lively, where they were exciting. And I'm sure that I'm going to be speaking to somebody tonight who had a great start with the Lord. Uh, you were saved by His grace. You started out right, but somewhere along the way, maybe your walk with the Lord drifted away and you find yourself in a place today where you never thought you would be. And today or tonight would be a good time to return to Bethel. Uh, God wants you to know that He is a God of second chances. Uh, he is a God who loves you in spite of where your path in life may have taken you. And God demonstrates these different truths in His dealing with Jacob. And I challenge you as I go through these next points tonight to let the Lord speak to your heart. So tonight I'd like to share with you three truths on how to get back to Bethel. Three truths on how to get back to Bethel. The first one I want you to see comes from verse 1 in chapter 35, and that's hear God's command. Hear God's command. And God said unto Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel, and dwell there, and make there an altar unto God that appeared unto thee when thou fleddest from the face of Esau thy brother. God's command was heard by Jacob. God called Jacob to go back to the place where he started for God. God's command was for him to go back there, to dwell there, to build an altar, and to worship God. It had been some 20 years since uh, his Bethel experience when he first met God. Uh, Jacob, he had gotten very far away from the Lord. He had gotten mixed up in idolatry. He had grown cold towards God. And now God is calling him back to the place where they first met. And I think it's safe to say that many Christians find themselves in that same place today or in that same condition today. The things of God have uh, become dead and the life of uh, the Christian displays that deadness. Uh, this is not a new trend. The church of Ephesus grew cold and indifferent towards the things of God. And the counsel that Paul gave the church at Ephesus uh, can be applied to us today. And the first thing he said is you need to remember. Uh, you'll see that in Ephesians chapter 2, 11 through 12. But I want you with me right now to think back to where the Lord found you. And think back when he saved you. Uh, just think back with me about your life before you got saved. You need to realize that God deserves better than he's getting from most believers. So you need to remember where the Lord brought you from and where you are today. But then you also need to return. God's call to Jacob and the Ephesians was the same. It was to return. His call is the same to you and me also. Uh, when we wander away from God, we need to return unto him. We need to go back to him. And I'm glad that when we do wander away and when we do stray away from God that He's going to receive us and He's going to restore us because He's a loving God. Uh, 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Uh, the story of the prodigal son is the perfect example of wandering away and restoring us back into a right relationship with the Father. And if we return to God, I can guarantee it, He will accept you. I was telling the teenagers this morning where we've been studying the, the life of Jonah and we use the prodigal son as an illustration. And when the prodigal son, when he's out on his own, when he's left the father's house, imagine what the father's going through. I mean, the father, he's going to be hurt. He's going to be sad. He's going to de, uh, be disappointed. But the one thing that is true is he longs for and he awaits the return of his son. He's longing for his son to get back. Malachi 3.7 says, Even from the days of your fathers you were gone away from mine ordinances, and I have not kept them. Return unto me, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. 
So not only do we need to return to the Lord if we've wandered away and if we've strayed from Him to go back to Him, we need to repeat. God calls the, uh, to Jacob and the Ephesian believers exactly the same. They were to do their first works over again. Uh, in Genesis chapter 28 and verses 16 through 22, the passage that we read when Jacob encountered the Lord, uh, he began his walk with God by performing an act of worship. He worshiped God. He humbled himself before the Lord. He called upon the name of the Lord, and he dedicated his life unto the Lord. Uh, they were early steps of commitment, but they were essentially the same acts of uh, the first love that God was speaking to the Ephesians about. And God is calling his people back to a place where he is first and foremost in their lives. He wants us to come back to our play, a place where our souls are filled with joy and happiness and filled with love towards him. So what does God want for us? God wants us to humble ourselves, then he wants us to call on him, and he wants us to dedicate our lives to him. So we see repeat, but we also see there was removal. Uh, the Ephesian believers are warned that if they fail to uh, uh, rekindle that old flame and love for Jesus Christ, that they would soon face chastisement. And I want to rem uh, remind you that uh, if you're saved, you're saved forever. You can't lose it. You can't be removed from God's family. But you can count on this. If you choose to walk away from God and you refuse to return to Him, you will face chastisement in your life you will face some unpleasant things because that's in his word and that's his promise. I, I think about as we've been studying the life of Jonah. Uh, you see in Jonah chapter 1 that the word of the Lord came unto Jonah saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach against it. And what did Jonah do? He got on a boat and went in the complete opposite direction of what God told him to do. And at the end of chapter 1, you see Jonah getting tossed overboard and swallowed by a whale. I'd say he faced some chastisement for disobeying God. Revelation 3.19 says, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous therefore and repent. So Jacob, here's a man who has not walked with the Lord as he should for over 20 years, but I still find it interesting that Jacob can still hear his voice. Jacob got saved 20 years ago. Okay, and he can, he's wandered away from God. He hasn't done anything he said he was going to do. And 20 years later, he still hears the voice of God. I believe that the most miserable person in the world is the believer who is away from the Lord spiritually, who can still hear his voice and his call. It has to be hard to remember the good days of walking with the Lord while being so far away from him today. Uh, that had to be how Adam felt when he was cast out of the garden and uh, he could no longer have uh, that relationship with the Lord like he had. But you don't have to live in that kind of misery any longer. You can return to where you were supposed to be. You can return to the Father, and He will receive you, and He will forgive you, and He will restore you, and He will put you again. So can you hear Him calling you? Can you still hear His voice? Jacob did, and his life took on a new direction. Uh, like I said in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It doesn't matter what sin you commit. It doesn't matter what you do. As long as you ask for forgiveness and you're repentant, God will forgive you. So you need to be able to hear God's command. But the second thing I want you to see tonight is you need to heed God's command. In verses 2 through 5, it says, Then Jacob said unto his household and to all that were with him, Put away the strange gods that are among you. And be clean and change your garments. And let us arise and go up to Bethel, and I will make there an altar unto God, who answered me in the day of my distress and was with me in the way which I went. And they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods which were in their hand and all their earrings which were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under the oak which was by Shechem. And they journeyed, and the terror of God was upon the cities that were round about them, and they did not pursue after the sons of Jacob. So God's command was heeded by Jacob. Uh, God says, what I want you to do is I want you to arise, I want you to go back to Bethel, and I want you to serve me there, I want you to build an altar, and I want you to worship me. Okay, and, and Jacob did just that. Uh, it was heeded by Jacob. Jacob knew that, though, if he was going to go back to Bethel, if he knew he was going to go back, some changes had to take place in his life and in his family's life. And by the way, God isn't the one who needs to change, we're the ones who need to change. Uh, Jacob... Uh, caused his family to make some changes before they began their journey back to Bethel. I'd like to point out some of those changes. And by the way, I think it's interesting that Jacob took the leadership role in the family. 
And I want you to know, uh, sir, it's not your wife's responsibility to lead your family. Uh, It's not your wife's responsibility to uh, get your children and your family ready for church. It's your responsibility. And uh, to think that we're going to have to, uh, men, that we're going to have to give an account of how we led our families, and that makes me a little bit nervous. You know, I I hope I'm leading my family the way I ought. So a couple things that they did. Notice with me in verse 2, they cast off their deities. Uh, Then Jacob said unto his household, and to all that were with him, put away the strange gods that are among you. Uh, If you think about Rachel, Rachel for a minute, when she left her father's house, uh, she took with her some of uh, her father's images, some of his idols. And in Genesis 31, 34, and 35, we see her father's coming. He's trying to to get those back, but she she wouldn't get off the camel. and, And so we see that she still has those idols. She still has them in her life. And she tried to take the idols with her. It was time for them to go. They had to be gone. And uh, our idols in our life must go also. All the things that steal our love and our devotion from the Lord must be removed from our lives if we want His blessings upon us. 1 John 5.21 says, Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Colossians 3, 1 and 2 says, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. Whatever takes your time, Whatever takes your money, whatever takes your devotion, is your God. Who are you serving? Or what are you serving? So we see they're cast off their deities. Uh, We see that in verse 4, that he buried them under the oak, which is in Shechem. So they cast them off. They got rid of their uh, deities. But they also cleansed their dirtiness. In verse 2, after it says, They put away the strange gods that are among you and be clean. You see, all filthiness, inward and outward, it had to be cleansed. A dirty life, it hinders worship, but a clean life will bring blessing. Uh, Psalm 68, 18 says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. And that is simply saying that, you know, if you go to pray to God, you got sin in your life and you haven't confessed it, the Lord's saying, you know what, if you got iniquity in your heart, if you got sin in your heart, I'm not going to hear you. Until you deal with that with me, I don't want to talk to you. And so I think of, Psalm 51, when I feel dirty from sin in my life, and apparently David, he felt dirty too when he sinned. In Psalm 51, alone, David asked uh, that great psalm, that's when he, uh, the prophet Nathan came to him and confronted him with sin about murdering Uriah and committing adultery with Bathsheba. And so uh, he's been confronted about that, and many believe he penned Psalm 51 after that. But he says uh, over seven times for the Lord to clean him from his sin in some different way whether it was wash me or cleanse me or purge me and so on and as we go through this life we're going to get dirty you know we're going to sin and there are going to be some times that we need to wash ourselves so to speak so they cast off their deities they cleanse their dirtiness but also once you see they change their dress he says and be clean and change your garments you see their garments they have been spotted by sin and clean uh, garments were symbolic of separation and if we are to ever be where the lord desires us to be then we need to clothe ourselves with god's holiness in first peter 1 16 it says for it is written be holy for i am holy second corinthians 5 17 says therefore if any man be in christ he is a new creature old things are passed away behold all things are become new there must be a difference between the child of god and the world there must be some difference there needs to be uh, a difference there and it's a shame i think the direction of many churches uh that they're headed these days and there's churches you see them and there's no distinction between uh them and the world you you don't know if you walked into a uh, a dance club or or a church you can't tell the difference and that is a shame and so they changed their dress because it was symbolic of separation but the next thing i want you to see is they created some distance they created some distance Verse 3 and 4 says, And let us arise and go up to Bethel, and I will make there an altar unto God, who answered me in the day of my distress, and was with me in the way which I went. And they gave unto Jacob all their strange gods which were in their hand, all their earrings which were in their ears, and Jacob hid them under the oak which was by Shechem. These things were buried not so that they, he could go back and get them later, but rather so they would be gone forever. Uh, what Jacob did here was a picture of repentance. Uh, Repentance is a change of mind that results in a change of direction in life. And when a person repents of something, they change their thinking about of it, 
and then they turn away and they walk away from it, putting some distance between themselves and that thing. So repent means to turn away and not to return to it. So some of God's people need to do that very same thing today. There's some things maybe in your life that you need to repent of today. You need to change your mind about those things and you need to change your direction in life. You need to walk away from those things or those people that are causing problems in your spiritual walk. And you need to put some distance between yourself and those evil things. Maybe you're thinking of a sin right now that you've been committing that uh, you haven't confessed and that maybe uh, you have asked the Lord for forgiveness, but you haven't really repented of it. Well, you need to change your mind about whatever that sin is, and you need to turn away from it and put some distance between you and that sin and move on. I find it interesting in verse 5 that uh, they were protected by God as they journeyed, and uh, those that seek the Lord, they're going to have some enemies that are going to try and come up against them. I think in our life, in 1 Peter 5, 8, it says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil is a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. But get this, nobody can prevent an honest heart from getting right with God. Nobody can prevent it, not even the devil. Psalm 145, 18 says, The Lord is nigh unto them all that call upon him, and all that call upon him in truth. Proverbs 18, 7 says, I love them that love me, and those that seek me early shall find me. So are you heeding the command to return to your Bethel, to where you first started? So the last uh, thing I want you to see, we are to hear God's command, we're to heed God's command, but we also need to honor God's command. We need to honor it. In verses 6 and 7, it says, So Jacob came to Luz, which is in the land of Canaan, that is Bethel, he and all the people that were with him. And he built there an altar and called the place El Bethel, because there God appeared unto him when he fled from his, the face of his brother. God's command was honored by Jacob. When he returned to Bethel, he rebuilt his altar, and there he worshiped the Lord. And when we hear and obey the call of the Lord, and we prepare our hearts and our lives for worship, then we can rebuild those old altars and worship the Lord again in spirit and in truth. And that's where the Lord wants to bring each and every one of us, a place of real worship. If you've heard this message tonight, and your response is something along the lines of, well, I don't really need to change anything. I'm happy where I'm at right now. I don't want to be any closer to the Lord than I am. I don't want to change anything in my life. I just want to be left alone so I can enjoy myself and I can do the things I want to do. Then I worry about you. If you know Him, there should be a hunger somewhere in your soul to be closer to Him. If you're saved, you should have a hunger and a desire in your life, to be closer to the Lord than you are now. There'll be a desire to worship Him, to love Him, to be near Him. If that, uh, if that tug is absent, then He may be absent as well. Maybe it's not that you need to get back to Bethel. Maybe it's that you need to get there for the first time and, and be saved. Uh, the altar of Jacob, the one that he built, is symbolic of several things. And when we return to our Bethel where we meet the Lord and we rebuild our altars... Uh, where things were exciting, where things were fresh, where we were excited about serving the God, we will find that they stand for a few different things. The altar that Jacob made, it spoke of worship. At the altar, God is adored. I love that choir special this morning, Holy is He. I think that's my favorite song that the choir sings. And there's a verse that says, it says, Crown Him with worship and praise, Holy is He. God must be adored by His people if there's to be real worship. That simply means we must come to a place where we're willing to humble ourselves before Him, confess our sins, claim His forgiveness, and lift His name in praise. Worship is about becoming less while He becomes more. Uh, a lot of people, they've got this uh, idea of worship. It's real messed up. But what is real worship? Uh, if you look up what worship really is, worship is all about getting low, lowering yourself to magnify someone higher. So for us, worship would be to getting low to lift up God. If you look and you study out worship, when you see it was about getting low, uh, about praise and worship, but this is not worship. This would be worship. Getting down on your knees and bowing before God to exalt the worth of another. Because real worship is about you becoming less 
so that he can become more. So it spoke of worship, but it also spoke of love. At that altar, Jacob gave God his best, and ultimately he gave himself. And he proved that he loved the Lord by doing what God told him to do. Uh, nothing says we love God by doing what he says. John 14, 15 says, If you love me, keep my commandments. So it spoke of worship, it spoke of love, but it also spoke of service. People came to that altar to make vows and of service to God. And God is looking for people who will selflessly serve Him, who will put Him first in their lives, who will give their all to Him. So it spoke of service, but it also spoke of obedience. God told Jacob to build the altar, and nothing less would have pleased God. If uh, God told Jacob to build the altar and he didn't do it, then God, God would not have been pleased. Uh, God demands total obedience. He doesn't want partial obedience. 1 Samuel 15, says, And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings as sacrifices and obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. So it spoke of obedience, but it also spoke of obligation. You see, Jacob, he owed the Lord a debt of gratitude for all the blessings that he had upon his life. And he paid that debt at the altar, and we are indebted also. Think of everything that the Lord has done in your life. Think of where he brought you from when you were lost to where you are now. And think about how little we've done in return for him. Because you can never outdo God. Never. We can always do more than we're doing right now. I like this. God does not require us to serve him as repayment for all he has done for us. But the redeemed heart that loves God cannot help but serve him out of gratitude. I want you to get that. God does not require us to serve him as repayment for all he has done for us. But the redeemed heart that loves God cannot help but serve him out of gratitude. I, I, that just strikes me to the core. To think that everything Christ did for me, how he left heaven, took on the form of a servant, came, lived for 33 years, was beaten for me, he was hung on a cross for me, he died for me, three days later he rose again. To think that he did all that for me, he doesn't want repayment for that. But the fact that he did that for me should lead me to a life of obedience. That because I have a grateful heart because he did me, uh, for what he did for me, that's enough repayment for him. I think of Mary in Mark chapter 14. Uh, she brings an alabaster box of ointment, uh, which was very precious. Many say that alabaster box of ointment was worth over a one-year salary at the time. And uh, as she brought this alabaster box of ointment to Jesus, people murmured against her. And Jesus said, let her alone. And then I love what he says at the beginning of verse 8. This is what he says. She hath done what she could. And I hope it can be said of me, and in my life, that Michael Futrell did what he could for the Lord. And I hope it can be said of everybody in this room that you did what you could for the Lord. And the last thing I want you to see is it spoke of sacrifice. You see, the altar was a place of sacrifice. Uh, the Bible doesn't record it, but uh, Jacob certainly offered a sacrifice to the Lord. Uh, the altar stands for sacrifice, but God, he isn't looking for blood. The blood's already been shed on the altar of the cross where he shed his blood for us. God is now looking for living sacrifices. Romans 12, 1 through 2 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, be you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove that it is good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. God is looking for those people who will place all they are and all they have on the altar for God's glory. It's those people who are going to enjoy God's best for their life. And it's those people who are probably going to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Hebrews 9.22 says, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without the shedding of blood there is no remission. And we see that, uh, why we know that Jacob offered a sacrifice to the Lord. So in conclusion tonight, God changed old Jacob's life after he came back to Bethel. Uh, God, after he goes back to Bethel and he rebuilds the altar and he worships the God, we see that uh, God changes his name from trickster to Israel. In verse 10 it says, And God said unto him, Thy name is Jacob, thy name shall not be 
called any more Jacob, but Israel shall be thy name. And he called his name Israel. And God renewed to him the promises that he had made to Abraham, to Isaac, and, to Jake, uh, and now he made them afresh for Jacob. Verses 11 12, And God said unto him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall be of thee, and kings shall come out of thy loins. And the land which I gave Abraham and Isaac, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed after thee will I give land. God did all of this for Jacob because he obeyed God's call and he came back to Bethel. He honored God's command. He heard it, he heeded it, he listened to it, and he honored it. So let's be honest tonight. There's some of us tonight that needs to get back to Bethel. You need to rebuild those old altars and you need to get cleaned up and you need to worship the Lord one more time. Wouldn't you like to have that peace again uh, that comes from serving God? Wouldn't you like to be able to come to church and worship instead of coming out of guilt or shame? Wouldn't you like for your prayer life to be a little more powerful, your witness be a little more clear, and your joy may be a little more full? You can have that and much more if you return back to Bethel. Some of us tonight, maybe you need to get to Bethel for the first time. You know that you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, and you know you need to be saved. There's no better time than the present. You're not guaranteed tomorrow, so maybe you need to get to Bethel for the first time. But either way, you need to get back to Bethel, and you need to enjoy God.